I'm Dr. Christina Madison, a clinical pharmacist. I'm here to answer your questions from the internet. This is Pharmacology Support. Purcell would like to know, what is it about grapefruit that makes it so dangerous to mix with so many medications? Like, damn, grapefruit goes through the liver. It's part of something called the cytochrome P450 system. What that means is that it can disrupt the metabolism of medications. It can alter the absorption of that drug, meaning that more of the drug will remain in your bloodstream and you'll be more likely to experience the toxicity associated with that drug and experience side effects. Tech with Taz asks, Expiration dates on medications. Are they similar to a bust buy situation or what? Any hot takes? Expiration dates are what we know to be safe and effective. Your expiration date is a guidepost. I like the term best buy, but ultimately there are some drugs that if you don't use them by their expiration date, they can become toxic. An example of this is doxycycline. Doxycycline starts to break down and the chemical that's left can be very toxic to you if you ingest it. Most medications, however, do not become toxic. They reduce their efficacy. You may have to take more, which means you possibly could take an inaccurate dose or have an overdose because you're taking more medication that's needed because it's not as effective. So the key here is, Whenever possible, please try not to take any expired medications. E. Shodan would like to know, why is botulism toxin, the most lethal toxin known, purposefully injected into humans for cosmetic surgeries such as Botox? Is there nothing else that could be used? Botulism toxin in the environment, yes, can be very toxic. However, what we currently use for therapeutic uses like cosmetic purposes or for things like migraine headaches is a very small dose that's targeted, localized, and causes limited effects. It's gonna cause localized paralysis, so no more wrinkles, but the toxin itself is not gonna get into my bloodstream and cause me to be sick or ill. Zarithi asks, how exactly do extended release pills work? So there's a few different things going on here. Oral medications are unique in the fact that they may undergo something called first pass metabolism. So medications are comprised of chemicals transformed through actions of our body. So one of the ways that that happens is through first pass metabolism where it gets metabolized in the liver. The chemical structure that is left after it goes through that process is called a substrate. So some of the time what we do in order to make the medication last longer is that we use a precursor to that substrate, which allows for the main medication or the active ingredient to get metabolized after first pass metabolism and become the active medication. The other thing too that we can do to extend the likelihood or the length of duration of therapy is going to be using a different type of container to hold the medication. There's tablets, there's capsules, all different types of coatings that can go over the tablet that allow for it to be dissolved or metabolized more slowly once it hits the acid of your stomach. From O. Coco, I don't think people understand how dangerous it is taking Tylenol regularly. Most over-the-counter medications are safe and effective when used as directed. However, Tylenol can be toxic specifically to your liver. So there is a maximum amount of Tylenol that you should consume within a 24-hour period. The max is four grams, however, for safety, most pharmacists would tell you you really shouldn't take more than three grams within a 24-hour period in order to avoid any injury or toxicity to your liver. The reason why this is important is because there's so many different over-the-counter cough and cold preparations that contain the active ingredient in Tylenol, which is called acetaminophen. So if you've got cough and cold preparation over here, and then you have some regular Tylenol over here, you have to add the two together and make sure it doesn't go over that three gram in a day limit. 
The only one left would like to know, why do some vaccines require a booster shot a few weeks later after the first one? There's a couple of reasons why this may occur. The first is whether or not the person has been exposed to the vaccination in the past. For example, most childhood vaccinations require lots of booster doses because it's new to their immune system, and we want them to develop an appropriate response. Same thing with the influenza vaccine or the COVID-19 vaccine. Once you receive it, we're basically priming the pump, and then we give you a booster in order for your immune system to be able to recognize it if it sees it in the environment. From OK Axis 3286, how do y'all Count your pills. Easy, by five. From when sad 5408 is it beneficial to get HPV vaccine after you have HPV? The quick answer is absolutely. HPV or human papillomavirus is a type of infection that can just be transmitted from skin to skin. And it is the leading cause of cervical cancer, vulvovaginal cancer, penile cancer, and anal cancer, as well as genital warts. All of those are caused by different strains of the HPV virus. Six and 11 have been associated with genital warts. 16 and 18 have been associated with cervical cancers and other types of cancers, including anal cancer and penile cancer. The vaccine that we have now has multiple strains that it protects against. So even if you've had HPV, you've probably only had one, maybe two of those strains, and you can be still protected by the other strains that are included in the current vaccination. Toby the Robot asks, how does a pharmaceutical company come up with new drugs? Do they just try various chemicals on animals until something shows promise? Pharmaceutical companies take a lot of pride in their research and development. It costs millions of dollars in order for them to develop a new drug. It can come from natural sources, it can come from synthetic compounds or chemicals. Typically, it's done from clinical trial work, looking at compounds that have been known to cause therapeutic effects in other disease states. And then we try it and see if it works in others. It's not really this, what you're saying, throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. Next is Funny Reputation 454. Favorite animal derived drug fact. One of the things that we know when we think about drug development and drug discovery is that a lot of the medications derive from venoms or toxins that are produced by animals or biological sources like viruses and bacteria. One of our popular diabetes medications comes from the saliva of a Gila monster. So one of my favorite animal-derived drugs is from Gila monster spit. Not corn emoji would like to know, why does DoorDash need my ID for cold meds? LOL, what do you think I'm going to do with it? Cough and cold preparations may include an active ingredient called pseudoephedrine. Those medications, even though they're technically considered over the counter, would be behind the counter in the pharmacy. The reason for this is that we have to document how much pseudoephedrine you're purchasing on a daily basis. Seems strange, right? Why would I need to know how much pseudoephedrine you're buying in a day? Before we had this restriction, pseudoephedrine was being used to fuel the methamphetamine processing in different areas of the country. We need to keep track of who's purchasing it in order to hopefully stem the production of illegal drug production. So. The reason why we have this requirement is so that we don't have more meth labs. Croy Celtic. Alexa, show me how penicillin was discovered. Dr. Fleming discovered it in 1928. He's a Scottish biologist that was working in a hospital in London and discovered after looking at a Petri dish that had some mold growing on it that the staphylococcus that was on that Petri dish was not growing in the place where the mold was. Ultimately, we discovered one of the most powerful antibiotics by mistake. Zara Toro VT would like to know, is melatonin dependency bad? Asking for me. So the first thing is, is that melatonin, you can't really become dependent on melatonin. However, too much melatonin can be a bad thing. There was an instance about a year ago where several children became sick or ill because of overdoses of melatonin from the use of melatonin gummies. It really should not be used on a regular basis 
basis, you should not be using this continuously for a sleep aid. Cindy Hindren 2 would like to know, why hasn't a cure for the common cold been found? The common cold is often caused by a rhinovirus. However, there's been 200 separate viruses and organisms that have been attributed to the causes of the common cold. That's a lot of different causes. So it does make a bit of a moving target. In addition to rhinoviruses, the common cold can also be caused by coronaviruses like COVID-19, as well as respiratory syncytial virus and RSV. And the good news is, is although we may not have a cure for those, we do have a vaccine for them. So when in doubt, get your vaccines. Market tanker. What do pharmacists actually do though that require five years training? Doctors prescribe medicine and last time I went, all the pharmacists did was tell me not to take more than dosage required. I could have read that easily myself from the leaflet. I am a pharmacist who went to school for many years, including a clinical residency. And I will tell you, we do a lot more than just stand behind the counter. We are the medication experts. Back there behind the counter, we're gonna be doing a whole bunch of other things that you probably don't get a chance to see, like checking for drug interactions, making sure that the drug that's being prescribed is actually used for that disease state. And most importantly, checking it to make sure that it's appropriate for you, the patient, and that it's safe for you to take. Bunny Sumo would like to know, if I drink alcohol whilst on antibiotics, will I die? Quick answer is no. However, it depends. First of all, how much alcohol are you drinking? Because alcohol toxicity can be pretty bad. When we're just looking at alcohol and antibiotics together, the key here is that there are some agents that you can get really sick from taking with alcohol. So one of those is something called metronidazole, which is an anti-infective, and it will make you violently ill if you take it with alcohol. Another medication, say penicillin. If you take that with alcohol, it may make the penicillin less effective because it's altering your gut. Rule of thumb, just don't drink until you feel better. Summer Ellen Lane would like to know, what are the pros and cons of Ozempic? The original use of this medication was to treat diabetes. And then they realized in addition to lowering blood sugar, it also caused people to lose weight. It improved their cardiac health. It reduced their cholesterol. It improved their kidney function if they had kidney problems associated with their diabetes. Also, it's being looked at potentially for Alzheimer's disease and it was recently FDA approved to treat sleep apnea. This drug, for all intensive purposes, seems like a miracle cure. However, there are some downsides. It can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of appetite. Loss of appetite sounds like it could be a good thing, especially if you're trying to lose weight. However, the weight comes from everywhere. And not only do you lose fat, but you lose muscle as well. Blonde Icon wants to know, why aren't more drugs that aren't very dangerous or addictive available over the counter, like antidepressants or weight loss drugs like Ozempic or Wegovy? There are two sets of medications that we currently have available in the United States. Those that require FDA approval and those that have been deemed safe and effective without the direction of a doctor or a medical provider. And those are over-the-counter medications. The other thing too is that an over-the-counter medication also has to have a low risk of being addictive, habit forming, or dangerous. Each medication that is considered over the counter must go through a rigorous safety check. The reason for this is that once you have something that is over the counter, you can take that medication as directed with no additional consultation by a pharmacist or another healthcare professional. Based on that, there are a lot of medications that we have that are over the counter, but the ones that are prescription that are being looked at to go over the counter, an example of this would be our allergy medications. So before the 2000s, Things like Claritin, Allegra, those types of allergy medications, those were previously prescription medications, but then were deemed safe enough to be able to be over the counter. One Hyacinth asks, why are there so many TV ads for plaque psoriasis? 
direct-to-consumer advertising for prescription medications is only something that occurs here in the U.S. and New Zealand. Every other industrialized country does not allow direct-to-consumer advertising to the patient. The reason why it seems like there are so many ads is because this law changed in the late 1990s and it allowed for pharmaceutical companies to directly market their products to the patient. This has caused some challenges within the healthcare system because everyone feels like they may have that certain condition. Now, going back to specifically plaque psoriasis, this is a condition that does not have a lot of medications that are effective to treat it, as well as the fact that the medication that are used are only available as brand name medications. Now, from the pharmaceutical company standpoint, it works for them because now they're marketing a very expensive drug that they're going to now profit from. So, you're gonna keep seeing more plaque psoriasis commercials until we come up with the generic and the profit margins are less. Nif G would like to know, pharmacists, what mistakes have you made? I like to say I'm a work in progress, but one of the things that I will never forget was a mistake that I made working as an intern at a pharmacy when I was still in pharmacy school. I had an elderly patient who came in to pick up their prescription for a cyclovir, the medication that can be used for genital herpes. It's also used to treat shingles. I did not ask the question, what did your doctor tell you this medication was for? So I mistakenly started telling this very kind elderly gentleman how this medication would help treat his genital warts. Unfortunately, he was there to pick it up to treat his shingles. I never made that mistake again. Roxa97 would like to know, what was considered medicine in the 18th century? So according to the American Journal of Hospital Pharmacy, during the Revolutionary War and colonial times, the 17 and 1800s, most of the drugs that were being used were to facilitate things like purging, depletion, bleeding, and things that we use back then would include camphor, opium and emetics in order to get people to purge things that they no longer wanted in their bodies. Bowie's body would like to know, as most, I do wonder why there's so many drug shortages. They're all so random too. ADHD medications, hydrocortisone, some benzos, magnesium citrate laxatives. Like what's happening in Big Pharma HQ? The quick answer is it's complicated. Number one, quality. So if there's something wrong with the quality of the batch of that medication, it will have to be remade. Number two, if the raw components of that particular medication are back ordered or not available, this could delay production. Number three, delay of the product. Number four, problems with distribution due to increase in demand. And last but not least, number five, not having profitability. This often happens with generic medications, and so the manufacturers will either reduce or completely stop making the drug because it's no longer profitable to them. From API Assassin, what is pharmacology and what do you enjoy about its study? Pharmacology is the study of drugs, their mechanism of action, how they work on the body, as well as how the body works on drugs. Pharmacology is a great thing for us because modern medicine shows us that if we didn't have medications, a lot more of us wouldn't be able to survive. Most importantly, in something like vaccinations, which is the single most effective medical intervention that we've had within our history, we know that there are thousands and thousands of children that would not survive if it wasn't for childhood vaccines. Tommy Webb 3 cr would like to know, how can AI assist in drug discovery and accelerating the development of new medications? It can help identify new potential drug targets, can also help us repurpose existing drug targets, determining what clinical trial participants are appropriate for a given study. And last but not least, it can help us synthesize mass amounts of data. And this is gonna help us further identify new drugs that we can use to cure old diseases. That's it, hope you learned something new. Those are all our questions for pharmacology support.